1994, Ted Price founded Extreme Software, later renamed to Insomniac Games, and quickly started on their first project, a first-person shooter called Disruptor. Releasing in 1996, Disruptor was met with above-average critical reviews but suffered from poor sales, pushing the newfound studio to the brink of bankruptcy. Needing a smash hit to save the company, Insomniac released a 3D platformer known as Spyro the Dragon. Spyro resonated with fans and critics alike, leading to over 1 million units sold in just over a year, paving the way for two sequels in the next two years and providing the push Insomniac needed to not only stay afloat but become an illustrious developer for years to come. Similar to his PlayStation brother in Crash Bandicoot, Spyro's first outing merely laid the groundwork for his eventual sequels, establishing the basics of what it meant to be a Spyro game. In 1999, Insomniac would release the highly anticipated sequel and my favorite Spyro game, Ripto's Rage. Spyro 2 does everything a good sequel should. It takes what worked in the original, improved upon that base, and added new and interesting spins on the traditional gameplay formula. Much like typical 3D platformers, players can run and jump through levels, but what makes Spyro stand out from the rest of the pack is its main gameplay mechanics that stem from his natural abilities as a dragon. Using his horn, Spyro can charge enemies or objects and crash headlong into them. This move can also be used as a quick way to traverse levels as well. He can use his fire breath to interact with the world like hitting switches or toasting enemies. Spyro can also use his wings to glide over large gaps, which offers up some unique platforming scenarios as compared to his competition. New to Spyro 2 is the ability to perform a hover at the end of a glide, which proves to be useful on mistimed glides or if the player comes up just short of a ledge or platform. Spyro can also swim on and underwater, which was hazardous in the previous game. This opens up the level variety in a big way, not only changing the look and feel, but also adding to the pacing of the game as a whole. Some levels might have a good mix of water and land sections, or bodies of water to explore and levels with more land areas. If that gives you cause for concern, don't worry, Spyro controls really well underwater, surprisingly. Same goes for on land, although it does take some getting used to. Insomniac attempted to give Spyro some weight to him, and it can cause some odd movements and wide turns sometimes. It's perfectly fine once you settle into the controls, unlike another certain reptilian platformer I'm sure I'll get to at some point. Spyro's base moves are fun to use in and of themselves, but the way Insomniac plays around with them in levels gives an added layer of depth to the sandbox of Spyro 2. Charging up to a ledge and jumping gives you more distance than it would at a standstill. Ramming smaller enemies is effective, but larger enemies are immune, causing you to take a hit. Some enemies are donned with metal armor or shields that render your flame breath obsolete. Same goes for certain objects in the world, such as metal pots that have to be smashed, or firework-laden bottles that explode on contact. The enemies within levels are more hazards than they are threats, and there's a neat little mechanic tied to defeating them. In the original, enemies who were defeated dropped gems, which added to the total for the level, making players run around defeating every enemy there was for 100%. In Spyro 2, enemies drop this glowing light which goes towards the level's power-up gate count. Scattered throughout each level is a power-up gate. These gates grant a specific power-up to Spyro upon entering them. These range from the ability of flight, to an extra powerful flame breath, to a supercharge. They're timed power-ups, meaning you only have access to these upgrades for a short amount of time before they're gone. These are an excellent addition that build upon Spyro's core mechanics while not becoming overpowered. Not all levels require these power-ups to be activated, but taking out enemies is fun enough, and knowing that it activates these power-ups for different side activities gives more incentive to hunt down each level's baddies. While doing so, you might take some unexpected damage, and that's where Sparks comes in. Spyro's health system is pretty unique to him, featuring a 4-hit system based on Sparks to Dragonfly's color. Taking a hit will drop Sparks from yellow to blue to green. Once Sparks is gone, the next hit will cause you to lose a life. To regain health, players must search the level for small animals or creatures that house butterflies Sparks can eat, going up one level of health color per butterfly consumed. It sounds more complicated than it really is, but it fits nicely into the type of platformer Spyro is, which is a much more laid-back version of a collectathon. Similar to the original, there are several open hub worlds that house Spyro 2's many levels. Summer Forest and Autumn Plains have seven levels apiece, with the final hub, Winter Tundra, having four. Each hub's selection of levels are all open from the beginning, offering up some much appreciated player choice. Once in these levels, there's only one stipulation to complete them, and that's getting to the end and being rewarded with the world's talisman. Collecting all the talismans in a hub will open up that hub's boss, whether that's Crush, Gulp, or Ripto at the end. While the original's bosses were laughable at times, Ripto's Rage goes for the equality over quantity approach and has a handful of solid bosses, especially the final boss that utilizes all of Spyro's power-ups in a unique way. Collecting all 14 talismans will grant the player access to the final hub, which is where Spyro's new collectible comes into play, orbs. Orbs are awarded for completing side activities in each level. Levels typically feature anywhere from 2 to 4 and require the player to do all sorts of things, from solving puzzles, completing platforming challenges, escort missions, stealth missions, you name it. They're short and sweet, most times anyway, and are always in service to Spyro's core mechanics. Completing them in short bursts is always fun and adds a ton of replayability, making players go back into levels they've completed to grab all these orbs. 40 are required to face Ripto at the end and beat the game, and usually by the time I reach Winter Tundra, I have typically about 20 to 25 already. While a few aren't too great, the majority are enjoyable, which makes having to backtrack more 
rewarding than annoying. Flight stages return from the original Spyro the Dragon and offer a bit of level variety. They're an arcade-like timed race to either collect or destroy various objects with added time for each object. While these levels are a fun distraction from the main game, I find they rely too much on trial and error, repeating them over and over to find the most efficient path to complete them on time. While the main game is fun on its own, the collectathon nature of Ripto's Rage is the driving force behind my love for the game. Searching out every gem, completing small side tasks to gain orbs, and pushing for 100% completion in each and every level, I love the simple action of collecting gems in Spyro games. Insomniac clearly designed this feature in a way that made it just satisfying. The many polygonal designs and colors, the numbers denoting their worth bouncing away after collecting them, the sound when picking them up, the glint they give off from afar, they're the quintessential collectible, and made even better in Spyro 2. Collecting gems was something mindless to do in the original, and its only gameplay benefit was achieving 100% completion in each level. To improve upon this, Spyro 2 introduces the character of Moneybags, who is essentially microtransactions personified. Would you like to learn to swim underwater? I suppose I could teach you for uh, a small fee? Certain areas or abilities are locked off from the player until they collect enough gems to pay money bags to access them. I'd say this is an obnoxious roadblock in any other game, but gems are so readily available, players collect enough just by prancing through levels anyway. Level totals are usually anywhere from 400 and up, plus a running total from hub to level makes it so you're almost never without enough gems. It's more of an incentive to collect gems, offering a tangible use for them in-game, and never gates meaningful content away from the player that forces them to grind. It's less of a nuisance and more of a design tactic to slightly push players into experiencing more of what the game has to offer. I mentioned Spyro was a much more laid-back version of a collectathon, and that has to do with how effortlessly it plays. While it's not devoid of challenge, Insomniac's Spyro games are very easy, at least compared to its orange marsupial counterpart. Just because Spyro lacks difficulty doesn't mean it lacks enjoyment, though. I much prefer Spyro's game design to something like Banjo or Mario 64, who has a similar gameplay and level structure. Levels are open to an extent, but they're much more focused with a lot to do and see, whereas Banjo or Mario's levels are impressively large for the time, but as a its content spread thin as a result. Does this mean Spyro is objectively better than Banjo or Mario? Not at all. It's just personal preference of short content filled bursts versus a more methodical approach to the collectathon design. With levels short and more open, there's tons of replayability, especially because Insomniac designed them to be played more than once. While there's the gems and orbs I mentioned earlier, there's also some abilities that Spyro can learn throughout the game, from the aforementioned swimming to climbing ladders. These elements are present from the beginning stages onward, so players are encouraged to go back to access new areas or gems they were previously unreachable. Spyro 2's fantastic group of levels are all diverse in their themes and gameplay. One level will have you bringing down electric force fields to progress, another escorting baby turtles back to their home, and another has you raising water levels. Each level is unique, but isn't tied to a specific theme. Spyro 2's level thematics run the gamut from prehistoric, to desert, to grassland, to arctic, to aquatic. There's no shortage of tried and true and creative levels from Ripto's Rage. Some of my favorites being Skello's Badlands, Robotica Farm, and Scorch. The neatest aspect of these levels is that they all have a small story arc within them. Obsessively, they all tread the same ground, a variation on some monsters came in and did a bad thing, can you help us out? They're simple yet charming and makes them stand out from another, adding a bit of unique context to each level. The cute little intros and outros each level has adds character to the world of Spyro the Dragon the original barely had. Same goes for the story. It's not Shakespearean by any means, but it's a simple tale of good versus evil that holds the game together nicely. Laura, Hunter, and the Professor are tinkering with a portal one day when Hunter inputs some bad coordinates and spits out Ripto and his two lackeys. Crush and Gulp. Finding the world he's been transported to without dragons, Ripto decides it's a nice enough world to take over and does just that. After the events of the first game, Spyro decides to take a little vacation with his buddy Sparks, and the two jump through a portal to Dragon Shores, only for the Professor to reroute the duo to Avalar to aid in the fight against Ripto. From there, Spyro must collect the previously mentioned talismans and orbs in order to defeat Crush, Gulp, and Ripto and finally go on vacation. Nothing special, but the dialogue can be pretty witty at times, coupled with some pretty great voice acting performances by pre-SpongeBob Tom Kenny as Spyro the professor, along with many other secondary characters. Just what I need for a new scepter. Hunter, do something quick! Uh, hey, give that back! Well, I tried. The world of Avalar is a great setting, and much more fleshed out than Spyro's previous adventure. Not only are there a plethora of locales I mentioned earlier, but each level and hub is brought to life by some impressive visuals for the time. Levels boast detailed textures, a variety of colors and tones, as well as weather effects and varying times of day. Coupled with Spyro's draw distance technology pioneered in the original, levels and hubs are a joy on the visual front. While some characters are rough on the eyes, even for 1999, there are much more that stand out as great designs overall, especially Spyro. It goes without saying that your main character 
character should visually pop, but in the case of Spyro, his models, textures, and both active and idle animations do a great job of establishing him as a timeless character. Spyro's got that 90s edge similar to Sonic, which is probably why I'm drawn to him so much. Yep, if you want to test that power crystal, why don't you try it on me? I'll stand still, I promise. The soundtrack ties the levels together with the great visuals. The original Spiral Trilogy had a very unique sound to them. Stuart Copeland, the drummer for The Police, was the composer for the PS1 Spiral titles, and he brought a different feel to the soundtrack. Copeland would play through the levels and compose tracks he felt would match the action and environment. While these tracks are nothing I would catch myself whistling, they serve their purpose by accenting each level and making these already great levels feel even better. Similar to Crash, Spyro was a big part of my childhood, owning and playing all three of his PS1 outings. And just like Crash, when Spyro got the HD makeover he deserved in the Reignited trilogy, it was a day one purchase for me. Having not revisited these games since my PS1 heyday, I was nervous that these games I grew up with wouldn't hold up as well as I remembered. Surprisingly, they did. So much so it inspired me to write about my favorite entry. If you've never played the original Spyro games before, I recommend the Reignited trilogy. It's gorgeously remade and controls like a dream. The developer, Toys for Bob, did an amazing job. Spyro has a very parallel existence with Crash Bandicoot, as you've no doubt come to realize through this video. Just like Crash, Spyro's peak was the original trilogy on the PS1, with a slow descent into mediocrity as the IP was passed from developer to developer, never really finding his stride. Although the majority of titles for the Purple Dragon didn't hit the mark, the original trilogy, and especially Spyro 2, show exactly how good a Spyro game can be. Full of charm and great collect-a-thon game design principles, Spyro 2 ripped those rage as a PS1 classic, and I hope the success of the reignited trilogy will pave the way for Spyro to return to his former glory.